Please remain standing with me. And those of you that are joining us online, you can follow along with us as we are in the series on the Beatitudes. We've been reciting these great words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5 together. So before uh, you're seated and I introduce our speaker this morning, I want us to recite these together from Matthew chapter 5. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside. His disciples came to him and he sat down and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, I have the privilege of introducing to you uh, our, our guest preacher this morning. He's not a guest of Chapel Street. Uh, Doug and his wife, Emily, and their family have been part of our church family now for almost four years, or maybe a little over four years. Uh, but Doug O'Donnell, is, uh, he's the senior vice president of Bible editing at Crossway Publishing. I didn't know you could edit the Bible, but apparently Doug does. Um, and uh, Doug, is, uh, he's been a pastor, he's planted churches, he's been a professor, he's taught and trained people how to teach the Bible all over the world. He's written and edited more than 20 books. Many of them are the books that on the preaching team we read when we're preparing to preach. I often text him and ask him about Greek words and theology. I could go on and on about how smart he is. But more important than that, Doug is a dear, dear brother in the Lord. He's been an incredible friend to me and support to me as a pastor over many years, and I'm very grateful, and I'm grateful to, uh, for his friendship and that you get to hear him bring the word of God. So join me in welcoming Dr. Douglas Sean O'Donnell. Great to be with you, and as Jeff said, our family's been coming here for four years, so it's wonderful to have the opportunity uh, to preach God's word to you. I too appreciate Jeff's friendship that goes back almost three uh, decades. So let's uh, pray, and then we'll open God's word. Heavenly Father, I bow in your presence. May your word be my rule, your spirit my teacher, and your greater glory my supreme concern, I ask, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus made many remarkable claims, but perhaps none as remarkable as when he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Think about that. If I told you that what I'm about to say in the next few minutes, every word that was mine, will be remembered when we're all dead and gone. In fact, when the whole world as we now know it is no more, what would you think of me? Well, those who know me might think I was making a joke. Those who don't know me might think I was one. You see, there's no one in the history of the world who had his head on straight, who talked like Jesus talked, claiming that their words have eternal value. Listen, I make my living in part, when I'm not editing the Bible, <laughs> I make my living in part by speaking. And yet I am self-aware enough to know that when words come out of my mouth, it's as if they just fade into the wind. It's as if time comes and just swallows them up. And it's not just my words and your words, it's just about everybody's words. In 2008, after President Obama's inaugural address, I remember how someone in the media said that our new president's words would be chiseled in stone. In other words, they would long be remembered. Now, I certainly would agree that such a speech by our first African-American president has real historical value to it, but I had to laugh at such a claim. And this may offend some of you, and I don't mean to be offensive, and I promise I'll be far more offensive later in the sermon, so wait then to be offended. <laughs> I had to laugh at such a claim only because I know from history I, that presidential addresses, even the best, even the most historically significant are easily, usually forgotten. 
Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Let's be honest, most Americans have forgotten the rest of Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address, and most of us have no idea what four score means. <laughs> Something to do with golf? <laughs> Listen, important words, they might be written down. They might even be chiseled in stone, but like most chiseled script on the monuments in downtown D.C., we have forgotten when and what and who said what, but not so with the words of Jesus. Not so. Isn't that remarkable? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever stopped to think, how is it that this poor man from the nowhere town of Nazareth, who lived 2,000 years ago, how is it that his words are alive today as the blood that flows through our veins? I don't care if you've gone to church since you were a baby, or this is the first time you've come to a gathering like this. You have likely heard Jesus' teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, no less, such as turn the other cheek, you cannot serve both God and money. Judge not, lest you be judged. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And our passage for today, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Those aren't words just chiseled in stone. Rather, those are words they are sewn into the very fabric of the world's civilization as Christianity has spread from the Middle East down to North Africa, and then up to Europe, over to North America, to South America, back to the rest of Africa, to India, and it is now spreading like a wildfire throughout Asia. You see, it's not just that God has got the whole world in his hands, but it's now also the whole world has got his words in its mouth. So as skeptical as someone might be about Christ and Christianity, I cannot grasp how anyone can disprove Jesus' prophecy about the longevity of his words. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Whatever you think of him, so far so good. He said his words will be around, and sure enough, I'm talking about them right now. And you're listening to me talk about them. A prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. And we're not alone. Every continent, every major city around the world on Sunday morning and every day of the week, Jesus is being praised and his words, his words are being explained and applied. He has been right about his linguistic longevity. Now that's what I call power, power absolutely awesome authority. Now, let me, let me ask you, what, what's the Sermon on the Mount all about? Jesus' most remembered words out of his remembered words, which includes the Beatitudes. Well, the short answer is Jesus. The longer answer is Jesus' authority and why we should submit to his true and his everlasting words. Now, why do I start this way? get your attention, which I have, thank you. <laughs> I start this way to offer some historical context on the words surrounding the verse we're going to look at today. And because if you don't believe Jesus is speaking authoritatively here with divine authority, then you won't listen. You won't hear. You won't obey what he teaches on the topic of mercy. Mercy. That's our theme for today. Well, so far in our series on the Beatitudes, we've looked at the first four, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We might call these, as they were called last week, the Beatitudes of need. We need to be humble. We need to be meek before God. We need to mourn over our sins and the sins of the world. And we need, we need God's holiness, so we need to hunger after his righteousness. Well, today we come to the first of the Beatitudes of actions, our actions towards others. Blessed are the merciful. There's the action. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, what I want to do today is, is give you four observations on this short but significant verse, followed by a divinely inspired illustration. It's divinely inspired because it comes from Jesus later in the Gospel of Matthew. So here's the first observation. Like the three Beatitudes before, this Beatitude has a present aspect, blessed are the present, the merciful, and it has a future aspect, for they shall or will receive mercy. 
In Greek, the phrase are the merciful is just one word in Greek. And it's what's called a present participle, which indicates, emphasizes the continuous nature of the verb, which means that the person Jesus is describing here is the person whose life is characterized by showing mercy to others over and over and over again. And then regarding the phrase, they shall receive mercy, it's what's called a divine passive, and the grammar lesson is free for today, which indicates that God is the one. God is the one who's acting upon the person. He will comfort, verse 4. He will satisfy, verse 6. And here in verse 7, he is the one who's going to bestow mercy upon the merciful, both during their lifetime and on judgment day and after judgment day. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's the first observation. The second is just as this reward of mercy, which is given on judgment day, is God given, the divine passive, so too is this desire and the ability to be merciful in the here and now. As James Montgomery Boyce explains, for if it's true that the first three Beatitudes show how a person must stand in his or her relation as a sinner to God, spiritually bankrupt, sorry for sin, meekly humble. And if it's true that the fourth beatitude contains the promise of God's provision of righteousness for the person who comes to God, then it's logical to expect, expect that the remaining beatitudes will reveal, look at this, listen to this, the transformed character of the one who has now been touched by Christ's spirit and is being progressively remade into Christ's image. Exactly. So second, just as this reward of mercy that will be given to us on Judgment Day is God-given, so too is the desire, the ability to be merciful in the here and now. Third, third observation, to be merciful as it's defined and illustrated throughout the Bible is both an attitude and an action. And it means coming to the aid of the needy. You can think of the parable of the Good Samaritan or Matthew's Gospel, the parable of the sheep and the goats where compassion and care and sacrifice are offered to those who are helpless and those who are hungry. So it's that, it's, it's giving to the aid of the needy, caring about the aid of the needy, coming to the aid of the needy, as well as loving and forgiving those who deserve retribution and judgment. So people who have sinned against you. So the merciful person is merciful at all times to all people, to the needy, those on the fringes of society, and even, even to their enemies, even to their enemies. Reminds me of the time in Corrie ten Boom, a Christian who survived a German concentration camp. She was helping Jews escape and hiding them, so she was in a concentration camp. She met one of her jailers, one of the guards in the camp, after the war, after she had given a public talk on God's grace, and the guard came up to her, approached her, reached out his hand, and said, to think as you say, God has washed away all my sins. Well, she was shocked and angry. And she says that, that just anger boiled up, vengeful thoughts boiled up in her heart, and she didn't extend her hand. Instead, she prayed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. You give him your forgiveness. And then by God's grace, she extended her hand. And as she recalls, as I took his hand in mind, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm, through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. While my heart, in my heart, sprang a love for this man, for this stranger, for this enemy that overwhelmed me. So merciful, to be merciful, it involves caring for the needy, but it also involves forgiving even our enemies, those who have deeply, deeply sinned against us. Fourth, Jesus is the ultimate example of an instructor on mercy. He's the ultimate example and instructor. The example, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus' mercy is demonstrated in the healing of the blind men who cry out, have mercy on us, son of David. 
And two parents, two different scenes, a mother and a father whose daughter and son are oppressed by demons. The mother cries out, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. The father says, Lord, have mercy on my son. And of course, Jesus, our loving Lord, he helps these poor people. He gives sight to the blind. He ousts the evil spirits. He, he demonstrates, he shows, he is the ultimate example of mercy. Of course, the supreme showcase of mercy, his mercy, is on the cross, right? This is the place where, where justice and mercy kiss. This is the place, as the artist Salvador Dali rightly depicts, and as historian Tom Nolan, uh, Holland correctly notes in his best-selling book, Dominion, this is the place on the cross where the king of the everlasting kingdom reigns over all of creation. I'm more on the cross in just a minute. But Jesus, the point here is Jesus is the example. He's the example of mercy. Jesus is also the instructor. Earlier this month, as I began to study this beatitude, I asked myself, Dr. O'Donnell, that's what I call myself, <laughs> what did Jesus teach about mercy in Matthew? Well, here's what I found. There are four times, other than our text for today, where Jesus uses the word mercy. Two are quotes from, uh, from Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The first is used when Jesus rebuked the Pharisees when he was outside of Levi's, Matthew's house, when he was dining with the detestable, supping with sinners. He said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not sacrifice. For I came to call, not the righteous, or you so-called righteous, but I came to call sinners like Levi and his friends. Later, Jesus used this again, rebuking the Pharisees. And they were chiding his disciples for picking the grain on the Sabbath and eating it. And he said to them, if you had known what this means, if you knew your Bibles, Bible boys, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would have not condemned the innocent. The final time when our Lord uses the word mercy in Matthew is also a rebuke to the Pharisees and he lumps in the scribes. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, the stuff that really counts. How does Jesus summarize the Old Testament ethics? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But there's one other teaching on mercy that perfectly explains, illustrates, and applies so much of what Jesus means in this beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And that is the parable of the unforgiving servant, which was recorded in Matthew 18. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there with me, Matthew 18. It might also be on the screen, but bring a Bible. It's good to bring a Bible. It's not a sin if you didn't bring a Bible. You can use your phone. I sometimes use my phone, but it'll be on the screen. The parable starts in verse 23, but notice what comes before it. Look at verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother, so he's talking about a fellow believer, sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? And Jesus, with his loving redirection, he says, I don't say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. That's what Jesus means. He mean, what he means by that is a limitless. It's limitless what your forgiveness is. It, do, it doesn't mean that you should have a forgiveness checklist. You got one of these that you have on your refrigerator. You check a box every time someone sins against you until you get to box 491. And then you burn the list and you bind your brother. Then all the axe throwing you've been doing will really come in handy. Now here our Lord is commanding Peter and us to stop counting and start forgiving. In other words, he's commanding us to be merciful. Now will another Christian actually sin against you 490 times? Perhaps. I don't know about you, but I think it's safe to say that I sin intentionally, unintentionally, at least once a day. More than that. So let's do the math. There are 365 days in a year. I'm 52. I know I look 51. <laughs> That's nearly 19,000 sins. Just imagine if my wife kept count. My children, my church, my God. Imagine if God kept count of all my sins, not to mention yours. Well, through Christ, God doesn't keep count. So you, 
You don't keep count. That's the point. Got it? As God in Christ forgives us again and again and again, he shows mercy. So we who are forgiven are to forgive our brothers in Christ and others again and again and again. We too show mercy. Now that principle brings us to the parable, which can be divided into three scenes. I'll cover just the first two. Scene one is covered in verses 23 through 27, where our Lord says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I'll explain. And since he couldn't pay it, his master ordered him to be sold, his wife and his children, all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. This first servant's debt was 10,000 talents. A talent was the highest unit of currency. And 10,000 was back then the highest Greek number that was used. So what is 10,000 talents? Well, the Bible scholar Robert Gundry calls it zillions. Now, I know a zillion is not a real number, but we all use this made-up word to say the largest amount you can possibly imagine. The lesson then drawn from the zillions is this. Like this servant, we are in the deepest possible debt to God, and we can't come close to paying this debt. And therefore, like this servant, the only choice we have is to plead for mercy from the king. Now, before we get to what the servant does next and how the king responds, I want to just stop here and for us to take note of Jesus' anthropology, his view of man, people. And then tightly and necessarily connected to his anthropology, his soteriology, his view of salvation. Here Jesus depicts human beings, due to their sin, due to our sin, not as being $7,000 in debt or $40 million in debt or, or $2 billion in debt, but rather as being zillions of dollars in debt. Which means what? Well, it means that Jesus thinks deep down, not so deep down, people are really, really sinful. Perhaps more visual than debt. Think of a zillion mile chasm between God's goodness and our badness. Or think of both. Now with Jesus' calculation, the implications for us are obvious. He puts to rest any notion of works, righteousness. There's not enough good works we can do to get God's approval. No, there, there's a zillion mile chasm. It's a, it's a zillion dollar debt. Good luck with the climb. Good luck with the bank loan. You won't balance that budget. You won't bridge that gap by yourself. You'll only balance it and bridge it by clinging to that old, rugged, and colossal cross. A cross that is deeper and wider than anything we could ever fathom. For if one person's debt, one person's debt is a zillion, what is the debt for the sins of the whole world for which Christ pays? You see, Christ's cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? was the cry of a zillion times a zillion sins laid on one man, laid on one God-man. Take that in. Take that in for a moment. Now back to the parable and the end of the first scene. When the first servant senses somewhat the gap, he prays the sinner's prayer, which is like it is here, always an imperfect plea. He falls on his knees, that's right. He implores the king, that's right, have patience with me, that's right. I'll pay you everything, that's wrong. You can't pay everything, remember the amount. But he honestly wants to and he recognizes that he needs to or else. So it isn't surprising that the servant put in the situation he was put in would reply the way he did. But what is out of the world unexpected is that the king would cancel the debt completely and out of pity. For him, the master of the servant released him and forgave the debt. This is amazing grace, marvelous mercy. The man just wanted a chance to repay, but what he got was a complete remission of debt. He wanted, he, what he got was forgiveness that was motivated by pity or what's usually translated compassion. 
What he wanted was just a patient king, but what he got was a patient and compassionate and forgiving and merciful king. Well, as the curtain closes on scene one, we all, in a sense, rise to our feet and give a standing ovation to grace and to the merciful king. Our greatest problem, deep debt, our inability to pay it, has been met by God's debt cancellation program, what we know as the cross. The complete forgiveness of indebtedness from a merciful king. Now, as the curtain opens for scene two, we expect to see great things from this forgiven servant. We expect a, a heroic man to emerge, not heroic in the sense of American cinema Rambo or Greek legend Achilles, men of violent vengeance. Rather, we expect a hero of gentle grace, of mild mercy, captain forgiveness. But instead, who emerges? The incredible sulk, Dr. Cruel, Mr. Supersonic Scum, whatever you want to talk, call this unforgiving servant. He's anything but heroic. Look at what he does, verses 28 through 30. But when the same servant went out from the king's chambers, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, I'll explain. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So the fellow servant fell down and he pleaded with him, have mercy with me, I'll pay you. He refused, and he went in and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now, just replay the scene with me. The first servant comes out of the king's chambers. He'd just been given forgiveness for a zillion-dollar debt. And what is the first thing on his mind? The first thing on his mind is finding the guy who owes him some cash and getting it all back immediately. You see, his mind, his heart is filled with no mercy, no patience, no forgiveness, no gratitude no grace. His king has just forgiven his debt. And if that's how a king would treat a servant, well, how should another servant treat another servant? Perhaps with some mercy. However, he finds his fellow servant. He, he seizes him. He chokes him. He says to him, pay me right now what you owe. Finding, seizing, choking, really choking a fellow servant over what? This must be a huge debt. What are we talking about? A million bucks? Now, what is owed is 100 denarii. A denarius was a laborer's wages for one day of work. So we're talking about four months wages here. Let's say $10,000, $20,000. That's not insubstantial. That's real debt. But it is insubstantial when compared to 60 million denarii. One talent equals 60, 60, 60, 000, or 6,000 denarii. So uh, uh, 10,000 talents is 60 million denarii. But since I said 10,000 was the highest number that was used back then, and talent the highest monetary unit, it's equivalent to the highest number you can think of, centillion or make up, zillion. So in comparison, this substantial debt is insubstantial. You think of it this way. Our debt to God is like the distance from the earth to the sun. Our debt to one another, you sin against me, I sin against you, is like the distance between Chicago and Detroit as viewed from the sun. There's real distance, but it's not comparable. And if God can bridge the first gap, well, then we're called to bridge the second. We should bridge the second. This is what the second servant attempts to do. He replies to the true accusation. He owes him money, almost precisely as the first servant did before the king. He fell down, he pleaded with them, have patience with me and I'll pay you. Now you'd think that action of kneeling before him, the, that verbiage, he says the same thing, would jog the first servant's memory. Oh, what am I doing? Your debt is forgiven, go. You're as free as I am free. And said he says nothing to him. His hard heart gets harder, and the memory of his own forgiveness is like dust in the wind. It's gone. He refuses this servant's petition and throws him into prison. I threw him into prison, perhaps hoping some sympathetic soul, a rich aunt, the king, would pay his debt, or he threw him into debtor's prison, where the debt would slowly but surely be worked off month after month through manual labor. Or this final move is irrational as everything he does before it. How can someone pay the money they owe you if they have no means of income? They're in jail. Whatever the specifics, I hope you see the picture. 
This is what a Christian, not forgiving a guilty, but repentant Christian looks like to God. It's despicable. It's disgusting. It's completely irrational. And that's Jesus' point. Don't act like this irrational idiot. Rather, as the prophet Micah put it, act justly and love mercy. You love mercy? Or as Jesus put it, be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Now the parable goes on, and here's the sad ending on the screen here. The parable goes on to, to frankly illustrate the reality of God's judgment against the unmerciful. And I don't want to downplay God's wrath. You can read this. You can take in what is said here quite seriously. But since my text for today is not this parable of judgment, but our Lord's beatitude, which is a blessing, I think it's only fitting that I end on a positive note. And also, I want to share something of my own story as it relates to mercy. So first, briefly, the positive note. So this parable, it might be summarized like this. Condemned are the unmerciful, for they will not receive mercy on judgment day. But the beatitude again is this. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall now and on judgment day receive mercy. We as kingdom citizens, we show mercy because God has extended to us in Christ on the cross mercy. And God will extend even more mercy when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. This is good news, is it not? This is good news. This is something quite positive. When I came to Christ at the age of 19, here's the major chain of events. After I got my girlfriend pregnant, we were 18, our son was born, and soon after, six months after, she broke up with me for good. After that happened in my life, that's when I came to Christ. That's when I came to Christ. And my sinner's prayer, it actually resembled your, the servant's prayer. It wasn't perfect, I promised too much, I overvalued my abilities. It wasn't perfect, but I'll tell you, it was from the heart, it was sincere. And it was reverent. God's holiness so overwhelmed me. The first time in my life I had a sense there's this spiritual gap, and it's pretty big, between me and him. And it brought me to my knees. It brought me to tears of repentance. It brought me to faith in the one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And soon after my conversion, mercy was the air that I breathed. I breathed in God's mercy. God being rich in mercy made me alive in Christ. I breathed in God's mercy and I, I breathed out God's mercy to others and I hope they'd breathe in, breathe in God's mercy, breathe out God's mercy to me. And I remember quite vividly reading afresh the Gospel of Matthew, coming to chapter 5, 21, near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and reading Jesus' teaching, which essentially said, before you come to worship God, first seek to be reconciled to those you've sinned against. Well, I closed my Bible, I took out a pen and paper, and I wrote a letter to two people I deeply offended with my sin, the girl's parents, and I sealed it and I mailed it. I was asking for forgiveness. I was seeking reconciliation. Well, I'm fairly sure they received it, but I, I have no idea how they responded. I still don't know today. But it honestly doesn't matter that much to me. It matters, but not much. What matters is that God gave me a new heart, a heart that was given this persistent power to receive mercy from God and extend it to others and want it back from others. I knew I was a changed man. I knew I was a kingdom citizen because I received God's mercy and by God's power, I was able and I continue to be able to extend God's mercy to others. Now, how about you? Does that describe you? You might remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Jeff and his sermon, Blessed Are the Poor in Spirit, he had us do some somatic listening, listening with our body. He first had us clench our fists to express how we might choose to, to fight against God. We might refuse his mercy, be defensive. 
He also had us extend our palms up to express this gesture of poverty of spirit. Poverty of spirit. Is this you when it comes to God's mercy? Now I'll add another gesture based on the beatitude for today. Do this. I want you to do this with me. Do this. Palms out. Do you extend through your attitude, through your actions, mercy to others? So do you receive mercy good, but do you extend mercy good to great? Put your palms down. And if you feel you have received mercy, but you cannot for a lot of different reasons, there's some good reasons, you have a hard time extending mercy. I want you to do this. You don't have to do it here, although the aisles are open. <laughs> Sometime today, find a quiet place. Fall on your knees. Do what is done here. Find a quiet place. Fall on your knees. Extend your hands high and pray, O oh Lord, Son of David, King of God's kingdom, have mercy on me. And Jesus, help me. Help me to extend mercy to others. Let's pray. Lord, I think on Corrie Boom's silent prayer, Jesus, I can't forgive him. You give him your forgiveness. But then how she was by your power able herself to extend forgiveness to her enemy, that prison guard. How remarkable. Lord, for some of us today, we feel that same anger towards an abuser, a spouse, a, a wayward child, a boss. Lord, grant your grace. Give us the mercy to reflect your mercy. Lord, as your steadfast love never ceases, your mercies never come to an end, may there be no end to our love, no end to our mercy towards others. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you've come here today and you want to learn more about how to receive God's mercy or how to extend it. You're really struggling with someone and how to extend it. There is a prayer room just back there in the glass uh, windows that you can go and pray with someone about the issues you're struggling with. I received the benediction. And benediction is a Latin word, bene, which means good, and diction, which means word. <laughs> and this is a very good word from Daniel 9.9. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. So receive his mercy and extend it to others. Amen.